This is NPR's Book of the Day. I'm Kia Miakonatis. Have you ever read a story and thought, dang, that character deserved better? Well, today, two books that take the power of disappointment and convert it into new narratives. Both books offer new tales about the women of Greek mythology, including a YA approach to the classic myth of Arachne. That book, in a little bit, but first, Circe, the powerful witch from the Odyssey who, in the original mythology, falls to her knees and begs for mercy when she encounters the hero, Odysseus. Author Madeline Miller felt like that tale gave Circe a raw deal. So she wrote a book, appropriately titled Circe, offering a much more nuanced telling of the nymph's rise to power and what happened after Odysseus and his men left her island. Here she is with NPR's Barry Hardiman. Circe's name means sorceress, and we often describe women as Circe's who are dangerous or irresistible. But your Circe, she sort of starts out very remarkably unpromisingly in a way, doesn't she? Yes. Well, I was really interested in the fact that aside from being, um, from becoming the first witch of Western literature, she uh, starts out as a nymph. And in the world of Greek gods, things were incredibly hierarchical. So life was pretty good for you if you were Zeus or Athena. But for those who were nymphs, the the lesser, lesser goddesses, um, you were pretty much prey. The only power you had was pretty much your divinity. Um, And so I wanted to start with that identity first um, and then talk about how she grew into her witchcraft. And Circe has to learn her craft. Yes. Witchcraft in the ancient world was something that you had to really work at. You had to harvest the herbs and do the right things to the herbs at the right time, saying the right words. And so I really liked that contrast between sort of the instant gratification of divinity and the hard work of witchcraft. There is, we do have the central set piece of the turning men into pigs. But you have given Circe a motivation beyond capriciousness. And I wondered if you always knew you were going to do that, since that is her central story, at least in the Odyssey. Yes. Um, Well, I knew that I, you know, in the Odyssey, there's no hint of a motive. Um, And Odysseus never asks her, which I think is really interesting. And, you know, Homer never explores it. So what's the message there that, you know, women are capricious and, you know, arbitrary and they do cruel things just because they can? I I think that's a very boring and shallow story if, if you look at it that way. So what draws Circe down that path is absolutely something that was kind of a part of the central conception of the story. Um, one of the things that I wanted is I wanted Circe's story to, to resonate with one of the major themes of the Odyssey, Odysseus is yearning for home. And I wanted Circe's story to be animated by a similar longing for home, but she doesn't have it so easy as Odysseus does. Um, Odysseus knows what home is. It's Ithaca, it's Penelope. But Circe has to not only yearn for home and find home, but she has to discover, she has to decide what that home is and make that home for herself. Circe is really looking for her humanity throughout the book. And it seems to me that where she lands is in a place that what makes life worth living is the end of it, is mortalness, is being mortal. Yes, because of what do you have to give up in in order to be a god? You have to sort of give up what makes us human, which is our ability to feel empathy, our ability to suffer consequences, to suffer in the first place. You know, gods don't really suffer the same way. They get angry. You can, you know, cross them, but they don't suffer. And I I think there, to me, there was something very powerful that if you don't ever suffer, if if you don't ever feel pain, how can you ever understand someone else's pain? Madeline Miller, her new book is Circe. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. In the classic mythology of Arachne, a young weaver has the gall to challenge a god to a weaving contest. Naturally, things don't end well for the young artisan, but a new book seeks to rethink this story through a feminist lens. Spin, the YA novel by author Rebecca Caprera, imagines an ostracized teen finding solace and confidence through her loom. Here, Caprera chats with host Tiziana Deering at WBUR's Radio Boston about writing mythology in verse for today's contemporary teen. A girl, her loom, and what happens when confidence replaces fear? That is the story of Arachne, 
Well, at least as told by author Rebecca Caprera in her new book, Spin. But that is not the story of Arachne that most people know. Normally, she's a villain, one who had the temerity to take on a god. But not for Rebecca Caprera. She tells a new tale of the young weaver, one meant for a new young adult audience. Rebecca Caprera joins us now in Studio 2. Welcome back, Rebecca. Thank you so much for having me. So I just adored this book. Um, And I just want you to start by telling us, if you could pick one word to describe this story, what would it be? Oh, that's a good one. Um, Feminist. Why? Maybe a second word would be brazen. Um, Why did you want to do that? Yes. So when I rediscovered um, Ovid's version of the myth of Arachne, um, and I reread that story, I had chills because this young woman struck me, and her story struck me as being so relevant and so timely. Um, This was, you know, in the midst of our current political landscape, in the midst of the Me Too movement, in terms of conversations about women's rights and bodily autonomy. Um, And there was just so much about her being bold enough and strong enough to speak truth to power that resonated, even though it's an ancient tale. But the issue I took with all the iterations that I'd seen of her story um, was with the ending. And I felt like she deserved better. And I wanted to give her that opportunity to kind of speak her truth and and tell her story as I envisioned it. So tell us just very briefly the original version of the story. Yes. So um, Arachne is a young woman who is a weaver, a very accomplished weaver. Um, And she, um, so she's often, like you said, framed as villainess or monster. And this story really wanted to unravel those those, uh, portrayals of her, as well as illuminating some of the distorted portrayals of other women throughout classical mythology. And in the original, um, there is this showdown between Arachne and Athena, who is the goddess of weaving. Um, and Athena demands that Arachne repent for her pride and her insolence. Her because, pride in her talent. Right, right, which is well earned, right? This is something that was not, there was no divine intervention. This is a skill that she learned. It was handed down by her mother and her grandmother, this craft of weaving. And she worked incredibly hard to achieve this skill. And so she is proud of it. Um, and she refuses to back down. And so there is this confrontation. And um, in other versions of the story, um, you know, Iraq, there is a transformation, right? Even in my version, there is this shocking transformation. But I... To? Uh, a spider. Spoiler yeah. alert. <laughs> <laughs> we get to do that on yes. the show. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but I wanted her to have more agency yeah. uh, without giving away too much of, of this story. I wanted her to have more agency. I wanted the reader to understand what might make a young woman um, have that kind of composure and strength you know, to stand up to a literal God. I mean, she's a young woman from very humble upbringing. So what did it take to get her there? And what was that backstory like? And I want to point out, you know, we were sort of joking about the spoiler alert, but in two ways, it's not a spoiler alert. One, because Arachne and Arachnid, it's not hard to right. connect the yes. dots. Um, and two, because it's not, as you say, it's not what happens to her in the end. It's the way it happens. That is everything uh, in this story. Yes. And, and what when, she does with it after. That's right. And when you talk about, you know, I asked you for one word, the first thing you said was feminist, mm-hmm. right? Um, and when you talk about the fact that she um, is proud of what she can do and the gods are mad at her right. for being proud of what she can do, that really is striking. One of the themes that comes forward in the story over and over again, Rebecca, for example, when she asks for what her tapestries are worth in mm-hmm. the marketplace and people are shocked when she asks what her work is worth. Right. It is this idea that over history, women and women workers have been expected to expect less. Yes, absolutely. There's th- that piece of it. Um, I think even this idea of, of female pride and female rage, these were things that were really interesting to me. You know, why why shouldn't she be proud of what she has accomplished? You know, why, why are we focusing all these narratives centering the heroic male counterparts in these stories and not celebrating the women who are perhaps equally talented in a different way? Um, yes, so... So I want to I want to take a I want to step to the side for a second. We're going to come back to the story itself in a minute, but I want to step to the side because I've read other books by you. Um, Worst case, Colin, I absolutely adored. You decided to write this one in verse. Yes, uh, and that it's it. I don't know if scared me is right, <laughs> but I'm like, can I do this whole Poetry's book in not verse? Scary, no, but no, I no, understand no. why people feel that way. And I'm going to give a I'm going to give it just a tiny bit of an example. This is from when uh, Arachne is watching her mother mm-hmm. weave 
before she even knows how. Row by row, an image emerges in the cloth, an emerald-leafed tree with a dark-haired girl swinging from its branches. Is that me? I ask, gazing at her creation with wonder. Uh, There is an ancientness to the form you've chosen that makes me feel like you're taking me back to that Greek story and then bringing it to me today. I love that you picked up on that. This is So verse is obviously a format I feel comfortable with. I love poetry. I've written other books in this format, but this one is slightly different. It's free verse. And I felt like um, I loved the musical quality of it, which you're kind of mentioning that lyricism that comes from the form. But I also wanted it to be a nod to the epic poetry of the past, right? The books and the sources that inspired me, you know, Homer, Sappho, Ovid, of course. Um, And so it's sort of a fresh take on on those poetic forms. And it's interesting that you're doing that for young adults. Are young adults afraid of verse? I mean, in the YA fiction world, um, where where is uh, my understanding is verse is beginning to kind of place a little bit of center stage? I, I hope so. I mean, I am a huge fan. Um, I think Jason Reynolds, Elizabeth Acevedo, Kip Wilson, there are so many, Margarita Engel, I could go on and on about the sort of YA um, poets who are writing verse novels for young adults and uh, middle grade readers. And I think it's very accessible. Um, I think verse is beautiful for so many reasons, but it's not overwhelming on the page. Sometimes prose can feel heavy. I think there's so much breathing room and white space in a verse novel, and it allows me as an author to explore what might be deemed kind of heavier subject matter because there's a lot of space for the reader to sort of sit with these ideas and kind of digest them and and take them at their own pace. We're talking with local author Rebecca Caprera about her newest book, Spin, which uses a verse form to retell with a very modern take, the story of Arachne. Um, and for those of you who are now thinking, wait, 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 I didn't write down those author names. What were they? Don't worry. Don't forget. You can find this conversation later at RadioBoston.org, and you will be able to hear all the authors that Rebecca was just recommending. I want to come back to the story now, um, because one of the things that I found myself thinking was, you must have studied weaving, because when she, when Arachne weaves her first tapestry, and even more so when she weaves her last tapestry. Your descriptions of how the colors come together and the types of thread and the dye, once again, something I didn't even think I cared about, and I can see it. I can smell it. I can feel it and touch it. Do you weave? Um, So this is sort of interesting. I love that you you connected to those scenes, I have to say, because when I pitched this novel and I'm like, yeah, the climax is a weaving competition. People (laughs) look at me like, "Uh, okay, that's about as exciting as watching paint dry. But it is. It's so exciting. And, and even Ovid's version, there's like these scintillating details and they use the vocabulary of war. And um, But to go to your question, um, I have a background in fiber arts many, many years ago. Um, in When I was in high school, I was a historical interpreter at Sturbridge Village in Massachusetts where I dressed and acted like a girl from the, the 1830s, which is obviously a different time period. So I learned to uh, weave on a different sort of loom than Arachne would have. But I was carding wool and dyeing, you know, fabric and spinning. So you do know. I do know. It's, you know, it's been a long time, but I think that that interest was sort of seeded deep within me. And then it was fun to revisit this. And I also, what was fascinating in the research portion of this uh, project was looking into the sort of the ancient dye methods. Her father, Arachne's father, is a dyer of purple. Um, And the process to get that color is fascinating. And, you know, there's a line in the book that says, violet begins with violence. Um, And it's really interesting. So the other thing that strikes me about this, and, and this is hard content for the next minute or so, I want our listeners to know, The power of her loom is to tell the truth. Yes. To tell stories of rape, to tell stories of sexual assault and victimization that have been either swept under or retold as if everything's okay. Yes. Yes. And I think for this character, I mean, she's illiterate, right? She can't read or write, but she finds not only does she seek solace in the loom, she has a very hard upbringing, um, but she finds her strength and her voice through the craft of weaving. And and in this confrontation with Athena, I think she's sold short in some other versions. You know, it's not just about her ego. Yes, she's she's proud, and I think she deserves to be proud. But she recognizes that this moment is an opportunity to speak out. The entire city has gathered to watch a mortal essentially duel with a goddess. And, um, and she realizes that this is her moment to kind of speak truth to power, 
to illuminate um, some of the injustices that have been inflicted upon her, upon the people that she loves, and upon the women and um, nymphs and goddesses that appear in these stories that have been handed down to her um, by her mother, and, you know, that she's heard the bards sing in the square. And so she does, she uses this. You know, I thought a lot about the Kavanaugh hearings when I was writing this. It channeled a lot of... Supreme you know, Court nominee. Yes, and Dr. Christine Blasey Ford, and thinking about that composure and, and taking that moment and speaking from a place... Of, of pain and trauma and just the fortitude and um, respect I have for for people who are able to do that, including Arachne. Just very briefly, yes. do you wish somebody had told you this story this way when you were a young adult? Definitely, definitely. And, you know, I'm only one voice of many. There's so many wonderful authors writing these retellings. Um, that would be a whole other segment. <laughs> <laughs> Which maybe at some point we should do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Local author Rebecca Caprera. The new book is Spin. It is out now. It is worth a look, Rebecca. Thank you so much thank for the book so much. and for being here. <laughs> Absolutely. My pleasure. That's it for this week on NPR's Book of the Day. If you want more, you can sign up for our newsletter at npr.org slash newsletter slash books. I'm Kia Miakonatis. This podcast is produced by Isabella Gomez Sarmiento and edited by Megan Sullivan. Our founding editor is Petra Mayer. The show elements for this week were produced and edited by Claire Murashima, Rina Advani, Amiko Tamagawa, Todd Munt, Elena Burnett, Courtney Dorning, Gus Contreras, Justine Kinnan, Samantha Balaban, Viet Le, and Amanda Beeland. Beth Donovan is our managing editor. Thanks for listening. <laughs>